Welcome to another video of Untold Discoveries. I hope you all are doing great today. A lost Mayan city, a submerged temple in Italy, remarkably well-preserved swords in a cave by the Dead Sea. These finds changed our perspective on history. The field of archaeology has been continuously evolving in 2023, making significant strides in uncovering new historical findings, preserving cultural heritage, and employing innovative technologies to study the past. The past year was a good one for archaeology. We've witnessed how new techniques such as AI can lead to breakthroughs, and scientists have shed new light on artifacts unearthed in earlier times, but it was also a year of new archaeological discoveries, including mummification workshops from Egypt that reveal some of the secrets of the ancient burial technique. A submerged temple in Italy built 2,000 years ago by traders from the Arabian deserts and a vast Mayan city that had been lost to the jungle but was revealed. With laser technology, here are of the most interesting new finds. Number 1. The Dead Sea Swords In June, archaeologists found four remarkably well-preserved swords that were left in a cave in the Judean desert between the 1st and the 3rd centuries AD a time when the region was a refuge. For Jewish rebels to Roman rule, wood and leather usually quickly rot. But here they were safeguarded by the dry environment so that the swords are complete with their hilts and scabbards. The swords were discovered after an iron point of a Roman javelin called a pilum and pieces of worked wood were first found in the cave southeast of Jerusalem and beside the Dead Sea. Researchers then searched the cave with metal detectors, which revealed the four swords wedged behind stalactites. It's thought the weapons were probably stashed there by Jewish rebels during the Bar Kokhba revolt. Between AD 132 and 136, after they had collected them from a battlefield or stolen them from Roman units, archaeologists are excited by the preservation of the wood and leather, which could help pinpoint where and when the swords were made. Number 2. A new giant stone head on Rapa Nui in February. Volunteers unearthed a newfound giant stone head called a Moi on Rapa Nui, also known as Easter Island, in the Pacific Ocean more than two. Zero miles off the coast of Chile, the statue is small for a Moi a little over five feet tall, while others of the roughly 900 on the island are up 33 feet tall. One unfished Moi would have been more than 70 feet tall when completed, but it was discovered in a dried up crater lake, and archaeologists think there may be more there to find. Most of the Moi were erected between 1250 and 1500, and local people regard the statues as the living faces of their deified ancestors. Nothing is known about this newest Moi, including which ancestor it represents, but archaeologists will search for the tools used to shape it from soft volcanic rock. Wooden tablets bearing glyphs called Ronga Rongo might explain more if only they could be read. Number 3 a lost Mayan city discovered by LiDAR. The revolutionary power of LiDAR laser detection and ranging was demonstrated in June with the discovery of a previously unknown Mayan city on Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. The technique uses airborne equipment to scan the landscape below with thousands of pulses of laser light every second, which can reveal otherwise hidden details beneath trees and other cover the historic bends and channels of the Mississippi River, for example and shelters built by soldiers during the Battle of the Bulge. Archaeologists who visited the site on foot have called the lost city Ocompton. From the Yucatec Maya word for its many stone columns, they think it was a major center from about AD 250 until it was abandoned when the Mayan civilization collapsed. Between 900 and 1000, possibly from drought and internal strife, Ocompton covers more than 120 acres and features plazas ball courts, elite homes, raised platforms, ritual altars, and pyramid temples. The remains of the largest pyramid are more than 80 feet high. Number 4. A Submerged Desert Temple in Italy Italian archaeologists announced in August their discovery near Naples of the underwater remains of a 2,000-year-old temple, which they think was built by ancient Nabataeans, hailing from modern-day Jordan and Saudi Arabia. The Nabataeans, who also founded Petra, were desert merchants who supplied the Romans with the luxuries of the East. Much of their trade arrived at the port of Puteoli, now Pozzuoli, a few miles west of Naples. The temple on the port's shoreline had been submerged during volcanic activity in the area, which is in sight of 
MT, Vesuvius. The underwater ruins include an altar to the Nabataean gods. And archaeologists suggest the temple served as a billboard for Nabataean culture, as well as a place of worship. A Latin inscription on a piece of marble recounts that Zaydu and Abdel Jaffer to camels too. The god, Dusharaw a sacrifice that may have been to benefit trade negotiations, or a blessing for a risky sea journey. Number 5. Two Mummy Workshops From Ancient Egypt Egyptian archaeologists announced in May that they had discovered two more workshops for mummification at the Saqqara necropolis near the ruins of the ancient city of Memphis, a few miles south of Cairo. The workshops are from the 30th dynasty 380 to 345 BC and the Ptolemaic period 305 to 30 BC, which is late for ancient Egypt, the Egyptian practice of mummification to preserve a dead body for its afterlife dates back thousands of years earlier to around 2600 BC, one of the newfound workshops at Saqqara features stone beds meant for the preparation of human bodies, while the other has smaller beds that archaeologists think were used to mummify animals. The researchers also found instruments for mummification, clay jars for entrails, and ritual vessels for embalmed organs, as well as supplies of natrona type of soda ash sourced from dry lake beds in the desert. That was a key ingredient in the embalming process. Number 6. Lost Gemstones from a Roman Bathhouse Archaeologists announced in June that they had found these gemstones at the site of former Roman baths in Carlisle, England. Clockwise from top left, the goddess Fortuna holds a cornucopia and an oar. A mouse gnaws a tree stump, an eagle spreads its wings, a man harvests cereal with a sickle, Venus clasps a palm, and perhaps a flower or a mirror. A spear-equipped Mars shoulders a trophy. Dozens of carved gemstones depicting Roman gods and animals were discovered at Carlisle in the north of England, amid the ruins of an ancient drainage system that carried water away from public baths in the 3rd and 4th centuries. Archaeologists announced the finds in June. It's thought the gemstones were worn in jewelry by wealthy bathers, but that they fell into the drains when their settings loosened from the humidity and heat of the baths. These Gems include semi-precious stones of agate, jasper, amethyst, and carnelian. Some are carved with images of Roman gods, such as Apollo, Venus, and Mars, while others show animals, such as rabbits and birds. Carved gemstones like this, called intaglios, were used by the Romans as a type of signature, often pressing a ring into clay or wax to create a seal. The ancient drains were found beneath a pavilion belonging to the Carlisle Cricket Club. The city was a regional center in Roman Britain, when it was known as Lugavalium. Number 7. A fateful wartime shipwreck in the South China Sea. In April, Australian searchers announced they had found the wreck of the Montevideo Maru, a Japanese transport ship that sank in 1942 with more than a thousand allied prisoners of war on board. The ship was carrying Australian troops captured during the Japanese invasion of New Guinea, as well as a contingent of Norwegian sailors and more than 200 captured civilians. The ship was bound for the Chinese island of Hainan, which was then occupied by Japan, when it was spotted by the American submarine USS Sturgeon near the northern coast of the Philippines. Not knowing the Japanese ship was carrying a lied pose, the Sturgeon tracked it for several hours before sinking it with torpedoes. None of the prisoners survived, and the sinking is the worst maritime disaster in Australia's history. Some Japanese crewmen survived, however, and reported that some of the prisoners who had made it onto makeshift rafts sang Auld Lang Syne to their dead comrades on the sunken ship. Number 8. Sacred Spring, Italy At the beginning of the 1st century AD, lightning struck a sanctuary at a site known as Bagno Grande, or Large Bath, for centuries. The thermal pool there had been sacred to both Etruscans and Romans when lightning hit. The sanctuary's priests were compelled according to both Etruscan and Roman beliefs, to bury under a layer of terracotta tiles hundreds of votive offerings that had been brought by pilgrims over the years. This ancient ritual, known as Fulgur Conditum, or Buried Thunderbolt, was intended to seal the objects in and mark the spot as especially sacred. Archaeologist Jacopo Taboli of the University for Foreigners of Sina describes the discovery of these offerings, which include bronze statues, of men, women, children, divinities, and individual body parts as a complete surprise. We knew from archival sources that in the 1600s, 
and 1700s, there was a thermal spa close to Begno Grande, he says. But we had no idea it was an ancient sanctuary. Among the rarest finds are 14 large bronze statues, some of which bear dedications to gods including Apollo, Asclepius, Hygieia, Isis, and Fortuna Primigenia, who are all associated with health and healing. As important as the individual artifacts, explains Taboli, is the sealed context in which they were found. The exceptional discovery here is the fact that we can unlock the site's sacred context and landscape by analyzing all elements, from the mud to the bronze, he says. We know that the Romans and Etruscans interacted continuously from the beginning of the first millennium BC, and that this included moments of conflict and of peace at the sanctuary. We see that there are safe spaces in which identities of different communities and cultures merged at this continued to be true even after part of the pool was buried from the 1st to 5th century AD. The site was considered sacred by pagan worshippers who left even more offerings, mostly bronze coins, trees, branches, and fruits and later by Christians. Number 9. Earliest Carpenters, Colombo River, Zambia. Rarely has a single find changed scholars' views of the capabilities of people of the past as radically as the discovery of the world's earliest known wooden architecture which dates to nearly half a million years ago, the pair of interlocking logs joined by an intentionally cut notch was unearthed beneath a bank of Zambia's Colombo River by a team led by University of Liverpool archaeologist Larry Barham. Researchers believe the logs may have formed part of a walkway or the foundation of a platform built over wetlands. Prior to this discovery, the oldest known surviving wooden structures were built by people living in northern England around 11,000 years ago. The 476,000-year-old log structure predates the appearance of the first modern humans by some 150 zero years and was likely the handiwork of the archaic human species Homo heidelbergensis. Paleoanthropologists believe H. heidelbergensis was highly mobile. Thus, it is surprising that the hominins would have invested labor in building a semi-permanent structure. We haven't seen archaic humans manipulating their environment on such a large scale before says Barham, it suggests an attachment to a single point on the landscape. At the same site, the team unearthed stone axes as well as for wooden tools dating to between 390,000 and 324. Zero years ago, these included a digging stick, a wedge-shaped object, a notched branch, and a flattened log. Marks on the log, notes Barham, resemble nothing so much as tool nicks on a workbench. Inviting speculation as to what other structures an imaginative H. Heidelbergensis woodworker might have fashioned. Number 10. A Painted Prayer, Old Dongola, Sudan. While investigating a house dating to the 16th century in Old Dongola, once the capital of the medieval Nubian kingdom of Makuria Ka, 8401 for OO, a team from the Polish Center of Mediterranean Archaeology at the University of Warsaw discovered a puzzling network of rooms beneath the floor. On the walls of one of these rooms a narrow, vaulted space measuring just three feet wide and nine feet long archaeologists found several unorthodox paintings that they believe date to the 13th century. One of these paintings portrays the Virgin Mary. Another depicts a scene in which the Archangel Michael holds a Nubian king in his arms and presents him to Jesus, who sits on a cloud and extends a hand for the king to kiss. This is completely uncommon for Byzantine Christian art, which generally does not show a lot of interaction or contact between mortals and immortals, says team leader Artur Abwoski. Researchers suspect this tableau is connected to a fateful moment in Makurian history. An old Nubian inscription accompanying the scene includes several references to a king named David, as well as a plea to God for protection of the city. Abwoski says it's likely that the painting portrays the Nubian King David who, for unknown reasons, launched an attack on the Mamluk Sultanate of Egypt in the late 13th century. Although the campaign met with some initial success, in 1276 the Mamluks struck back forcefully and were advancing on Dongola. I see this wall painting and inscription as a prayer, as a call to God when the Mamluk army is approaching, says Abwoski. At this moment, the king prays to God to protect the city he loves, the city of Dongola. The plea fell short as the Mamluks sacked Dongola and eventually captured and executed King David. 
Number 11. Magical Mesoamerican Relics, Mexico, the Templo Mayor. Including the massive pyramids at the heart of the Aztec, or Mexica, capital of Tenochtitlan, is like a Russian doll, says archaeologist Leonardo Lépez Luyan of Mexico's National Institute of Anthropology and History. When you dig within a Mesoamerican pyramid, you find another that is older and smaller, he says. In the ninth of 13 total layers, Lépez Luyan and his team have uncovered a small chest made of volcanic stone that, like the Templo Mayor complex itself, contains many layers of meaning. Inside the chest, they found 15 perfectly preserved anthropomorphic figurines made of serpentine, along with Aztec symbols of water and fertility, such as marine sand, a pair of rattlesnake-shaped scepters, hundreds of green stone beads, and seashells, snails, and coral, the layer of the temple in which the chest was found. Dates to the year 1 Rabbit, or 1454, when, under Moctezuma I reigned 1440 to 1469, the temple underwent one of its most impressive expansions. But the figurines were already 1,000 years old at the time and had been brought to Tenochtitlan. From around 100 miles away, these types of figurines were typically produced from around 500 BC to AD 680 by the Mezcala people, who were based in an area that is now in the southwestern Mexican state of Guerrero, in their most sacred space. The Aztecs made the objects their own by embellishing them with paint and placing them in the chest as offerings to their rain god Tlaloc. Tenochtitlan was the center of the Mesoamerican world, says Lépez Luyan. Objects were brought from all of the provinces of the empire and even beyond its borders. The Mezcala figurines were considered by the Aztecs magical relics from the past, he says. Many of these offerings are cosmograms or representations in miniature of the universe as conceived by the Aztecs. The chest and its contents symbolized a mythic realm known as Tlalocan, which was recreated by Templo Mayor, where the rain god kept water and sustenance. Number 12. Hunter-Gatherer Fortresses, Russia Researchers have learned that the earliest known fortresses in the world were built by Neolithic. Hunter-Gatherers around 6000 BC in the taiga of western Siberia Archaeologists have long been aware that indigenous people in the region lived in fortified settlements defended by palisades, banks, and ditches, but believe such sites dated to no earlier than the early Iron Age. Around 1000 BC they were puzzled, then, when radiocarbon dates obtained in the 1980s at one such site suggested a fortification there had been constructed millennia before, in the Neolithic period, the researchers wondered. Were hunter-gatherers of the era sophisticated enough to build such elaborate defense works? They doubted the accuracy of the dating, says archaeologist Ekaterina Dubov Seva of the Institute of History and Archaeology of the Russian Academy of Sciences. A team led by Dubov Seva and Free University of Berlin archaeologist Henny Pizanka has conducted new radiocarbon dating of 20 fortified taiga settlements and confirmed that the earliest offensive sites were indeed built by Neolithic hunter-gatherers some 8,000 years ago, making them the earliest scientifically dated examples of such fortresses in the world. Dubov Seva notes that during the Neolithic period, the number of people living in the taiga zone increased dramatically due to newly mild climatic conditions. The environment of western Siberia now seems to us rather harsh and unfriendly, she says. But for hunter-gatherers and fishers, it was a real paradise. A population boom could have led to tensions that caused Neolithic people to enclose and fortify their winter villages. Dubov Seva says that medieval and early modern written accounts and oral history indicate that the indigenous people of western Siberia lived in fortresses because they could be attacked by their neighbors at any moment, perhaps, she says. These early Neolithic settlements reflect the origins of such behavior. Number 13. Inca Workers' Homelands, Machu Picchu, Peru Nestled on a mountain ridge in the Yurubamba Valley, Machu Picchu was built as a palace that was part of Fulgur royal estate belonging to the Inca Emperor. Pachacuti reigned Ka, 1420-1472. A team of retainers skilled workers including Craftspeople and religious specialists maintained the estate year-round while the emperor and his entourage resided in the capital of Cusco, 45 miles away. Until now, who these people were and where they came from has been a mystery. In 1912, 
Explorer Hiram Bingham excavated the burials of more than 100 of these retainers outside the palace walls. Some were interred with pottery decorated in both provincial Inca and non-Inca styles, including depictions of people in Amazonian dress and in garments resembling those of the Inca. New genetic study of 34 of the retainers, led by Yale. University archaeologists Richard Berger and Lucy Salazar. Archaeologist Jason Nesbitt of Tulane University and biological anthropologist Lars Ferenschmitz of the University of California, Santa Cruz, reveals that Machu Picchu's caretakers hailed from almost every part of the vast Inca Empire, which at its height stretched along South America's west coast from what is now northern Ecuador to northern Argentina and parts of Chile. The researchers were particularly surprised to learn that one-third of the individuals came from to different regions of faraway Amazonia. This suggests that at least part of the Amazon was more fully integrated into the Inca Empire in ways that scholars hadn't appreciated before. Berger says, Amazonian people weren't just on the other side of a frontier that had distant trade relations with the Inca, with the exception of one mother-daughter pair. The retainers were not related, indicating that they were located to Machu Picchu individually rather than as families or community groups. Most of the males came from the highlands, Ferenschmidt says. While a significant portion of the females seem to have had ancestries associated with the lowlands and coastal regions while living at Machu Picchu, these people had children and formed new family bonds, creating an ethnically diverse community. Number 14. World's Oldest Bukalhiba, Egypt, a 10 by 6 inch piece of papyrus is. Researchers now believe part of the world's first book and, like many, of the volumes that fill offices, libraries, and homes, it has had many lives, the papyrus fragment, which was unearthed along with hundreds of other pieces of papyrus at the site of El Hiba in 1902, began as a bound document dating to 260 BC that recorded taxation rates for beer and oil, scrawled in Greek letters using black ink. The sheet was then removed from its binding and sent as a letter before being transformed once, again when. It's painted with images, including one depicting a son of the falcon-headed god Horus, and reused as wrapping for a mummy during the Ptolemaic period 304 to 30 BC using microscopic and multispectral imaging. A team led by conservator Teresa Zamet Lupi of the University of Graz learned how the book was made. You have a plain sheet of papyrus, folded in two, written on, and turned into a booklet, says Zamet Lupi, the different bifolios or single sheets folded in the center, were attached via tackets, flexible material used to join to things together, similar to a modern ring. Binder, the presence of holes for the tackets to pass through, a handful of which still have remnants of thread, and the symmetrical link transfer across the precise fold at the center, confirmed that the bifolio had once been bound within an ancient manuscript. An accountant must have detached the bifolio from the book, folded and sealed the letter, and then passed it on to a creditor or a debtor, says Zamet Lupi. The discovery pushes the origins of book binding back by centuries. The oldest book previously known was from the 1st or 2nd century AD, so this predates anything by up to 400 years. Zamet Lupi says the book could be indicative of how transactions happened, of how people lived, wrote, and passed information to each other. Most importantly, we learned that the structure of the book as opposed to a scroll, existed well before we thought. Number 15. Imperial Menagerie, Xi'an, China. Near a royal tomb complex dating to the Western Han Dynasty to 106 BC AD 9, archaeologists discovered the remains of more than 400 sacrificed animals including the first complete skeletons of a giant panda and a tapir to have ever been found in a tomb in China. In all, the excavation has unearthed remains of 41 different rare species, such as a yak, tiger, tortoise, green peacock, red-crowned crane, and snub-nosed monkey, some of which were buried with their own grave goods. The scale of the animal sacrifice is unprecedented in Chinese history, says archaeologist Hu Song Mai of the Shaanxi Academy of Archaeology. The animals were buried with their heads facing the royal tombs, which included those of Emperor when reigned 180 to 157 BC and his mother, Consort Bo, who died in 155 BC the species represented in the sacrifice. Some 
of which may have been sent as tribute from Southeast Asia, were status symbols and were intended to accompany the emperor and his mother to the afterlife. Number 16. The Fiddler's Theater, Rome, Italy. Roman emperors were known for many things, among them displaying their superior military and diplomatic skills, penning enduring philosophical treatises, and raising great buildings. The emperor Nero reigned 54 to 68. A.D. was famous for, among other less, entertaining quirks, his singing, according to several ancient Roman authors. One of Nero's favorite venues in which to stretch his vocal chords was a private theater he built in the gardens of Agrippina, a luxurious villa that belonged to his mother in the Roman neighborhood near the Vatican now called Vaticano. Nero's theater is known from literary sources the Roman historian Tacitus may have been referring to this building when he wrote about the emperor singing of the fall of Troy as he watched Rome burn in July of AD 64. The structure was largely dismantled from materials in antiquity, and its precise location was unknown until archaeologists unearthed its remnants in a Renaissance garden. The impressive ruins include the theater's cavia, a 138-foot-wide semicircular seating area, and a rectangular space with entrances and stairways. Another building may have been used to store sets and costumes. Both structures were built of bricks dating to the period of the Julio-Claudian emperors to 7 BC AD 68. In particular, Caligula reigned AD 30 741 and Nero. The theater was just one part of the self-aggrandizing building campaign Nero undertook across the city, which included construction of the Domus Aurea, or Golden House, which served as his monstrous private pleasure palace, like the Domus Aurea. Nero's theater was decorated with marble columns in white and a variety of colors, as well as gold-covered stucco, many examples of which were unearthed. This discovery has the double value of confirming the existence of a brick theater in the gardens of Agrippina, says archaeologist. Number 17. Sealed Tomb of Cherberus Discovered in Giugliano Archaeologists have discovered an exceptionally well-preserved tomb in the municipality of Giugliano in Campania, Italy. The discovery was made following an archaeological investigation in the Flegrio Domitiana area, where previous studies have found a high density of burials from the Republican Age to the Roman Imperial Age. The investigation identified an opus in certain wall first thought to demarcate the boundary of the necropolis, however. Upon a closer inspection, it was revealed to be the frontage of a monumental chamber. Tomb. The tomb was found with a slab made from tough sealing the entrance, leading to a chamber with preserved frescoes across the ceilings and walls. The most notable fresco depicts Cherberus, thus the tomb being designated Tomb of Cherberus, the three-headed dog from ancient Greek mythology. Cherberus, also referred to as the Hound of Hades, guarded the gates of the underworld to prevent the dead from leaving. The scene represents the last of Heracles' twelve labors, in which Cherberus is captured by Heracles. Also depicted in the tomb are mythological scenes of each Thios centaurs, centaurine-type sea creature with the upper body of a human, the lower anterior half and forelegs of a horse, and the tailed half of a fish. The scene shows to each Thios centaurs facing each other and holding a Clypeus a shield worn by the Greek hoplites and Romans while being attended by two winged Arotes Roman Cupid-like babies. According to a press announcement by the Superintendent of Archaeology, Fine Arts and Landscape for the Naples metropolitan area, the tomb has frescoed ceilings and walls in perfect condition, with mythological scenes that go all around the room and figurative representations among which a three-headed dog stands out, three painted cloknai an altar with vessels for libations. The deceased still placed on the funeral beds with rich objects complete the picture of a discovery which, in this area, is unprecedented. Number 18. Well-preserved 3,000-year-old sword found in Germany. Archaeologists from the Bavarian State Office for the Preservation of Monuments have announced the discovery of a well-preserved Bronze Age sword in the town of Nördlingen, Bavaria, Germany. Most Bronze Age remains around Nördlingen belong to the Urnfield culture, often divided into several local cultures within a broader Urnfield tradition, which emerged around 1300 BC. The Urnfield culture grew from the preceding tumulus culture and developed advanced metalworking, skills in bronze weaponry and armor. The sword was found among a deposit of grave goods and weaponry, alongside the remains of a man 
woman and child. The discovery is extremely rare for this part of Germany. As most burial mounds have long been looted during antiquity or opened during the 19th century, archaeologists from the Bavarian State Office for the preservation of monuments have announced the discovery of a well-preserved Bronze Age sword in the town of Nördlingen, Bavaria, Germany. Most Bronze Age remains around Nördlingen belong to the Urnfield culture, often divided into several local cultures within a broader Urnfield tradition which emerged around 1300 BC. The Urnfield culture grew from the preceding Tumulus culture and developed advanced metalworking, skills in bronze weaponry and armor. The sword was found among a deposit of grave goods and weaponry, alongside the remains of a man, woman and child. The discovery is extremely rare for this part of Germany, as most burial mounds have long been looted during antiquity or opened during the 19th century. Number 19. Researchers find oldest known Neanderthal engravings. A study published in the Open Access Journal PLOS One has provided evidence to date the age and origin of engravings discovered on a cave wall in France, conducted by a team of researchers led by Jean-Claude Marquet from the University of Tours, France. The study confirms that these engravings were undeniably crafted by Neanderthals, making them the oldest known examples of such artistic expressions attributed to this ancient human species. Advancements in scientific research in recent years have provided valuable insights into the intricate cultural world of Neanderthals. However, the realm of symbolic and artistic expression remains largely unexplored. While only a small number of symbolic artifacts have been associated with Neanderthals, their meanings and significance continue to be subjects of ongoing scholarly discussions addressing this knowledge gap. Marquet and colleagues have made a significant breakthrough in their study, unveiling ancient engravings found on a cave wall in France as the earliest known manifestations of artistic expression by Neanderthals, the cave known as La roche cotard in the center Val de Loire of France, contains a series of non-figurative markings on the wall that are interpreted as finger flutings, marks made by human hands. The researchers made a plotting analysis and used photogrammetry to create 3D models of these markings, comparing them with known and experimental human markings based on the shape, spacing, and arrangement of these engravings, the team concluded that they are deliberate, organized, and intentional shapes created by human hands to establish a comprehensive understanding of the cave's history. The research team went beyond the artistic aspects and conducted optically stimulated luminescence dating on cave sediments. The results unveiled a significant event occurring approximately 57,000 years ago when the cave was effectively sealed off by sediment accumulation, predating the establishment of Homo sapiens. In the region, this temporal context, coupled with the exclusive presence of Mousterian stone tools within the cave technology closely associated with Neanderthals constitutes robust evidence firmly, establishing the Neanderthals as the creators behind these engravings, the presence of enigmatic, non-figurative symbols within La roche cotard cave presents a captivating mystery regarding their intended meaning. However, their temporal correlation with cave engravings produced by Homo sapiens in various global locales adds another layer of intrigue. This growing body of evidence points towards a rich tapestry of behaviors and activities exhibited by Neanderthals, underscoring their remarkable complexity and diversity, which parallels the creative endeavors witnessed in our own human ancestors. Number 20. Celestial Reliefs Depicting the Heavens Uncovered in the Temple of Asna, Egypt A team of researchers from the Egyptian Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities and the Université Tübingen have uncovered a collection of ceiling reliefs during restoration works in the Temple of Esna. The reliefs are a representation of the heavens that depicts the signs of the zodiac, several planets such as Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars, in addition to a number of stars and constellations used to measure time. Over the centuries, the reliefs and their vibrant colors became covered by a layer of dirt and soot, preserving them for nearly 2,000 years. Christian Leitz, director of the Department of Egyptology at the University of Tübingen said, Representations of the zodiac are very rare in Egyptian temples. The zodiac itself is part of Babylonian astronomy and does not appear in Egypt until Ptolemaic times. The archaeologists suggest that the system of zodiac signs and their related 
Constellations didn't appear in Egypt until they were introduced by the Greeks, which were then used to decorate private tombs and sarcophagi. The zodiac was also of great importance in astrological texts such as horoscopes found inscribed on pottery shirts. It is rare in temple decoration, apart from Esna. There are only two completely preserved versions left, both from Dendera. Added leets, the team also found images of various creatures, including a snake with a rum's head, a bird with a crocodile's head, the tail of a snake and for wings, and depictions of snakes and crocodiles. 21. Lost Roman forts discovered using Cold War spy satellites. A study of declassified imagery taken by Cold War era satellites during the 1960s and 70s has led to the discovery of 396 previously undiscovered Roman forts. The forts are spread across the Syrian steppe in what is now Syria and Iraq to protect the eastern provinces from Arab and Persian incursions, according to the researchers. The forts are in a region where a proposed defensive line of 116 forts were identified in an aerial survey conducted by Father Antoine Poitbard in 1934. Since the 1930s, historians and archaeologists have debated the strategic or political purpose of this system of fortifications, says lead author of the research, Professor Jesse Kasana from Dartmouth College, but few scholars have questioned Poitbard's basic observation that there was a line of forts defining the eastern Roman frontier. Number 22. Archaeologists uncover the first human representations of the ancient Tartsos people. Archaeologists excavating at the site of Casas del Turuquelo have uncovered the first human representations of the ancient Tartsos people. The Tartsos culture emerged during the late Bronze Age in the southwest Iberian peninsula of Spain. The culture is characterized as having a mixture of local Paleo-Hispanic and Phoenician traits, while speaking a now extinct language called Tartessian. The Tartsos people were skilled in metallurgy and metalworking, creating ornate objects and decorative items. Characteristic Tartessian bronzes include pear-shaped jugs, shallow dish-shaped braziers with loop handles, incense burners with floral motifs, fibulas, and belt buckles. They are believed to have worshipped the goddess Astarte or Potnia and the masculine divinity ball, or Melkar. This was due to acculturation by their Phoenician trading partners. A press release issued by the Higher Council for Scientific Research CSIC has announced the discovery of figured reliefs depicting human representations during excavations at Casas del Turuquelo, a Tartessian site in the province of Badajoz. Two of the reliefs appear to be female figures which the researchers suggest could be representations from the Tartessian pantheon of gods. The three other reliefs are fragmented and in a poorer state of preservation. However, one of them has been identified as a Tartessian warrior. Number 23. Giant to point three meter long Dakokan sword among unprecedented discoveries in burial mound. Japan, archaeologists from the Nara Municipal Buried Cultural Properties Research Center working in collaboration with the Nara Prefectural Archaeological Institute of Kashihara, have uncovered a giant 2.3-meter-long Dokokan sword during excavations at the Tomio Mariyama Burial Mound in Nara City, Japan. The Tomio Mariyama Burial Mound dates from the 4th century AD during the Kofun period AD 300 to 538, the earliest era of recorded history in Japan. The mound has a diameter of 86 meters and rises to a height of 10 meters, with previous excavations uncovering farming tools, utensils, cylindrical copperware, bronzeware, and several decorated mirrors with god and animal motifs. Recent excavations have uncovered a giant to point 3 meter long Dakokan sword made from iron, along with a shield-shaped bronze mirror in a layer of clay that covers a 5 meter long wooden coffin. Typically, bronze mirrors found at archaeological sites in Japan are rounded, however, the one from the Tomio Mariyama burial mound is shield-shaped and measures 60 for centimeters in height by 31 centimeters. In width, the center of the back of the mirror is raised, with two rounded patterns that are identical to the patterns typically inscribed on Deryukyo, mirrors from the Kofun period, according to the researchers. The surface of the shield-shaped bronze mirror is the largest of any known bronze mirror found in Japan, with the only Comparable example in size being the bronze mirror discovered at the Hirabaru ruins in Fukuoka. The sword, which is around to 0.3 meters in length, has a slightly 
bent blade like a snake. A typical example of a Dakokan sword related to the worship of the snake god. The sword is the largest discovered. Intact in Japan, with experts suggesting that it had a ceremonial purpose to ward off evil. The archaeologists are yet to open the wooden coffin, but believe that its contents remain intact as there is no evidence of grave robbing. The team plan to study the coffin's contents at a later date, with the sword and mirror currently undergoing restoration. Sego Wada, director of the Hyogo Prefectural Museum of Archaeology, told Asia and Japan Watch, I wonder about the status of the person buried with the objects as the individual was interred with a very unusual sword and mirror. There is a high expectation for the study of the contents of the coffin. That's it for today. We will meet with another interesting topic very soon.